on WRFP LP 101.5. Old Clear City Council is now in session. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Anderson? Here. Beaton? Here. Berge? Here. Christofferson? Here. Emmanuel? Here. Gregert? Here. Klinkhammer? Aye. Here. Lohr? Here. Weld? Here. Worthman? Here. Zhang? All right, good afternoon to everyone uh, here in chambers and, and those of you joining us uh, remotely and, and again to my fellow council members that are joining us remotely as well. Um, today is our Tuesday, September 8th legislative session of the Eau Claire City Council. Um, during a legislative session this afternoon, the council members will be participating either remotely or in person to, to deliberate and take action on the agenda items before us today. City staff and council members spent a great deal of time preparing for this meeting. And again, I am sincerely appreciative and, and uh, uh, for their continued work and dedication to this community. I also want to thank Valley Media Works and their staff for live streaming this meeting. To watch, please visit valleymediaworks.org or visit channel 994 on Spectrum Cable. The first item on our agenda is the COVID-19 update from City Manager Peters. Good afternoon, Mr. Peters. Good afternoon, Council President Weld and members of the City Council. And uh, thank you as we take just a few minutes and talk about and reflect on where we're at in our community with COVID-19. Um, as usual, we'll start with just a couple of ways we get information, and there has been a few changes. Uh, the best source of information is, of course, our COVID-19 uh, hub uh, that is maintained by the City of County Health Department. So the, the best place to get accurate information is to go to our website. Concerning our metrics and statistics, there's been a few changes. Uh, now, instead of uh, updating on Wednesday, those statistics are going to be updated on Thursday. So we're, that's being shifted out a day. That is uh, an effort to better coordinate our numbers uh, with the state and the way the timing is being done by the state for their reporting. It also means that when there are updates to the local health order, instead of that coming out on Thursdays, that is now going to be coming out on Fridays. So everything is shifting out uh, a, a day there. This change in uh, our metrics and statistics is also then changing uh, when we're going to be doing the live updates. Um, our health director, Lisa Gizzi, uh, is, is still doing updates, but those updates are now going to be once a week on Thursdays at 3.30, and they can be viewed live on YouTube um, at the website uh, and, or, and or Facebook uh, at the links that are, are shown on your screen. So live updates are now going to be once a week on Thursday at 3.30. Then, of course, we have a call center, which is staffed to take calls and provide uh, accurate information to members of our community. And that number is 715-831-7425. And, of course, you can get more information on Facebook or on the, um, uh, the website for the, the health department. As to our statistics, um, we've crossed a, a threshold mark uh, of 1,000 cases um, as of uh, uh, the, the most recent poll of data, we have 1,000 people who have tested positively for COVID-19 in Eau Claire County. There's been 19,162 negative tests. We unfortunately have had six members of our community that have uh, died uh, because of COVID-19, and an estimated 859 individuals in Eau Claire County have recovered uh, from this disease, and to date we've had 41 people that have been hospitalized for the disease uh, in our community. Um, just a little bit about kind of where we're at uh, this past weekend, the three days from Saturday through Monday, we reported 80 or 95 cases. Uh, this is the highest three-day uh, total of cases that we've had since March. 
Um, this is a little more than we had expected and a little sooner than we expected. With the schools uh, opening, we had expected uh, to see an increase, uh, but uh, 95 cases in three days was, was more than we had expected and perhaps a little sooner. The community spread, however, does stay steady. It's still high, uh, but it does still stay steady uh, within the community. And because of the higher number of cases, the contact tracing uh, is now in the red category um, rather than the yellow category. We'd also like to point out that uh, in our, um, uh, on the website that the health department maintains, we uh, now have a, a map that shows the municipalities that have community uh, or um, cases in them uh, by municipality and that is updated every two weeks. I would just perhaps take a moment and remind uh, anyone who is who's listening to this that, you know, uh, the spread of COVID-19 is exponential, um, meaning it has the opportunity to, uh, to double uh, very quickly. Um, and our community, uh, meaning the broader community of Eau Claire in our region, we've got an awful lot at stake uh, with controlling this disease. And it really is worth our efforts to try hard to control this disease. You know, doing the things like keeping our social circles small, washing our hands, using our masks, and just a reminder to everybody that we all, as individuals, uh, have opportunities to impact where this goes in our community. And it's important that each one of us model good public health habits and that we respectfully ask those around us uh, to do the same. Because frankly, if we lose control of this, um, what happens is we'll overwhelm the healthcare system and we overwhelm our public health capacity. And we'll end up taking steps backwards uh, for our schools and for our businesses. And this, of course, will have huge or large uh, personal impacts and impacts on our, our families and impact the quality of life. So we must be careful, we've got to be diligent, and we have to respect how fast this can spread. Because once we lose control of it, it does become very difficult uh, to regain control of it. So um, just a few thoughts or reflections as we look at those, uh, uh, the, you know, the, that, that current data and, and what's recently come out. Um, these next few slides are the metrics that are on the website. Uh, and um, you can see really under the number of cases, this is organized in three categories. One is disease occurrence. And you can see that uh, our percent change has uh, gone from green to red. Um, in the category of healthcare, um, we are still doing fine uh, with green in both of those categories. And when it comes to our public health response, uh, we've gone from green to red in our contract, uh, contact tracing. Uh, when you have 95 cases in three days, that generates uh, many, many, many contacts that have to be traced uh, and followed up on. And so, um, a case rate that increases that much taxes our ability to do the, the contact tracing. Um, in terms of just some general updates, the city's emergency order remains in effect and through uh, September 22nd. We continue to plan for uh, the October drive-through absentee voting uh, and uh, we're going to be increasing our capacity because again, we we're expecting uh, probably closer to 12 or 16,000 people that are going to come through and use our drive-through voting. We're also going to be adding drop boxes. Uh, there will be five drop boxes throughout the city. Four of them, or um, I'm sorry, four drop boxes. So four drop boxes throughout the city. Three of them are going to be located at the festival locations uh, throughout the city. So it provides a nice spread, geographic spread one on the west side, one on the east side, one on the south side, and then at City Hall is also a drop box. They will be uniquely painted red and clearly say City of Eau Claire drop box on them. Uh, and we are going to be able to pick them up uh, at a minimum. We will check the boxes every 48 hours and at some times we'll be able to check them every uh, 24 hours. The Elections Commission recommends that you have one box for every 15 to 20,000 registered voters. Voters. Um, this will mean that we have a capacity of one for every 10,000 registered voters. So we have, uh, we're able to saturate the community with these drop boxes at a rate that's uh, uh, significantly better than even what's recommended by the election commission. 
Uh, one of the advantages to these three sites is uh, they are um, uh, at sites that have um, uh, people that are there 24 hours a day. They will be under video surveillance um, and be secure. So um, it's, it's a nice opportunity to be able to provide more access to dropping off uh, absentee votes in a way that we can keep secure and also in surveil under surveillance and geographically spread out. Um, in terms of the emergency uh, executive authority that um, for the, I guess, the emergency orders that, that we're under, uh, we had two things that, uh, really, really three things that happened in the last two weeks. Um, in terms of the, uh, with the students returning to UWEC, we've been able to add additional bus capacity uh, because the buses can't hold as many students. So we have added uh, additional uh, bus capacity for routes 9 and 19 uh, that is going to be paid for by the um, COVID relief funds uh, that we've received from the state. Um, and, um, and so far we haven't needed to use the extra bus, but we are making that available and monitoring that situation very carefully. We also approved some temporary sidewalk encroachments um, for businesses that were placing spacers with them in the sidewalks. And then finally, in terms of uh, uh, executive authority and emergency uh, of operations, um, the ho transition at Hobbs continues to work. Uh, we have uh, actually Catholic Charities is working with um, the ownership of the former um, IGA store in the Shopco Plaza. And work has begun to retrofit that for a new temporary facility for um, our residents that are experiencing homelessness. Um, it is anticipated that they will be able to move that uh, temporary facility up there the first week of October. Um, and we expect to have ice available uh, on, in the facility and start resuming some operations there um, uh, around uh, September 19th. Finally, um, just in terms of next steps, as a reminder, the governor's order uh, for masks is effective through September 28th, and we are prepared to have a local approach uh, if that is needed uh, before then. We're also preparing ordinances that could extend past the emergency order, uh, and this involves remote meetings and how the council can continue to have uh, remote meetings, which are uh, currently required by your ordinances unless we're under an emergency order, and also how to support uh, the health order uh, uh, going forward when we're not under an emergency order. And on your agenda tonight um, is the first reading for the, uh, the remote meeting uh, ordinance. We, of course, remain flexible to changing conditions um, and the orders as they, uh, they may change around us. We're making operational adjustments, as you can see, uh, as needed, and we continue the economic recovery efforts and supporting the response to the TOGETHER plan. Uh, our health director, Lisa Gizzi, is also on the call, and I would certainly entertain any questions that you might have, and I know that she's available for questions you might have as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Uh, is there any questions from council for either uh, City Manager Peters or? Or health director uh, Gizzi. Uh, Councilmember Berge. Thank you, Council President, and thank you for that update, uh, City Manager Peters. Uh, I always appreciate that. I was just wondering in regards to the drop boxes, when those would be put out. I'm sorry you broke up. I, I did not hear the hear the question. Oh, I tried to repeat it. Yep, I'm sorry. When will the drop boxes for the ballot be put out? Um, I think they're working on them right now. Um, Carrie, do you have a more specific update on that? We are planning on putting them in place on this Thursday. Ballots will be mailed beginning next week. Sounds great, thank you. Thank you. Council Vice President Emmanuel. Thank you, Council President Wells, and thank you, Mr. Peters, and uh, Health Director Lisa uh, DC for all of your continued leadership and strategizing with um, each new day and sometimes new hour that is upon us. So um, deep appreciation. I have a question around um, some of the larger gatherings that has been observed um, at some of the bars. 
and um, there's pictures that have gone around on social media. Um, I have been cooped up in my little house, my small little house, so I haven't seen it myself. However, um, I have seen the photos on social media, and I've received at least one email from a citizen who's pretty concerned about really large gatherings at a bar and wondering, um, I guess, how is the city addressing that, and um, kind of where are we at on that type of situation? Ms. Giese or Mr. Peters? Thank you, Council President and Council Member Emanuel. I can certainly give a brief response, but then, of course, the city can, uh, you know, I, I, we can pitch it either way. But from a public health perspective, of course, um, gathering in the way that is seen in some of the pictures on social media is certainly not a recommendation. Um, we are working very closely with the owners of establishments um, across the community, but certainly in those situations that you see with the pictures, to talk through strategy. And there have been a number of strategies now employed with um, places on sidewalks um, indicated for people to space. Um, part of the reason that people are outside these establishments is because they are following inside the requirements that we have related to number of people and physical distancing. So one of the consequences of that is that there are people congregating outside. So the city has been working along with Chippewa Valley Economic Recovery Task Force and the health department to work with those establishments to find strategies to encourage people to not congregate and find ways to space them out as they stand there. Thank you, Ms. Giese. Uh, Councilmember Anderson. Yeah, thank you, Council President Wells, and thank you um, for these helpful updates today. I have a question. Um, following up on the um, ballot boxes, um, I'm wondering, you know, I just want to make sure um, when I'm talking to folks that if I have this correct, once the ballot boxes are in place and people receive their absentee ballots, can they start putting their ballots in right away or is there a date when they'll be unlocked or when they'll be being started to being checked? Um, what would you recommend people do when they want to put their start, start voting? Ms. Repo. Carrie, would you like to take that? Yep. As soon as they receive their ballots, they can complete, lip, complete them and put them in the drop box. We will start checking drop boxes the day after we start mailing them. So immediately. Great. Thank you so much, that's helpful. We're hopeful that uh, the, the residents will find that this is a, a, a nice alternative to, to mailing the ballots. Uh, Council Member Worthman. Thank you, Council President. Um, I guess this is a two-part question uh, to Council Director Giese, but I wanted to ask about, um, you know, it's, it's something that I've noticed um, in terms of establishments um, that people are often not wearing masks inside. Um, and it concerns me. I actually did have a chance to see Water Street a couple weeks ago and um, just the number of people that are in establishments without masks on uh, worries me. And the, you know, I think, I guess the question there is just um, what, you know, what is being done? How are we thinking about how we might have to take a different approach in the community if we see, you know, continue to see the number of cases spiking like we saw in the last week. I mean, it's clear to me that um, this could really get out of hand, and I, I'm hoping that, that there's some strategy in thinking through how we might have to change course and think about what's actually essential in our community uh, and, and make some of those decisions. Uh, Ms. Giese or Mr. Peters? So, 
Thank you for that comment, um, Council Member Worthman. Um, certainly, the work we are doing is to try and reinforce the actual risks that exist with this, um, with COVID-19, and um, really work with community partners to find shared interest in following those practices. So the order and all of our communication are really focused on just what you speak of. Um, we do have concerns and we are continuing to talk to individual facilities. We have through our legal team um, in incident command, we are doing direct follow-up with specific um, places as we get complaints and we do have a process for that and do know that that continues to happen. And um, and we, we will continue to do that. There are a number of other ways also that we are impacting, you know, working to, to really change what practices we're seeing locally. So you know, building shared interest has been our primary objective with a lot of conversations and meetings happening related to that. Thank you for that. Um, Council President Will, would I be able to ask a, a question regarding voting? Certainly. Thanks, and this is to City Manager Peters. Um, I had seen this opportunity, uh, a number of Eau Claire cities, um, sorry, Wisconsin cities have applied for funding, um, grant funding to help with any election needs. Um, is there, do you see that we may have um, some expenses where, you know, it would make sense for us to be applying for grants, whether it's to do with poll workers or any of the other logistics um, to running a, a, a safe and, and accessible election? Absolutely. So we are tracking the extra expenses that we have for elections related to COVID. Um, and um, we'll be submitting those through, there's a couple of different uh, avenues and certainly the grant that you just referenced is one of those that we're exploring to see if we can get recovery. So we anticipate that um, much of the, the extra expense that we have for conducting the full elections uh, safely will, will be reimbursed uh, through um, either the CARES Act uh, or uh, possibly the grant that you just referenced. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from Council? Councilmember Gregor. Thank you, uh, President Weld. Um, thank you, Mr. Peters, um, Ms. Giese. I guess my, just kind of want to dig a little deeper on the, the topic of taverns because I have heard from a number of residents in my district who have, who even feel that you know, the establishments should no longer be allowed to be open. Um, I guess I'm not sure if that's something that has even been considered at this point, but one of the um, questions related to that that I've heard batted about is the idea of reducing hours and seeing if that would be something that would be of, of shared interest um, and be a benefit from the perspective of public health. So just kind of wanted to see what you thought of a, a broad-based um, approaches that you know, maybe reduce some of the risk maybe later at night with regard to changing the hours of taverns. Ms. Giese or Mr. Peters, Mr. Nick? Thank you, Council Member Gregor. Um, the Health Department is certainly exploring options with legal about what is possible to do related to all of our points where we see transmission um, more likely um, in this community. That's part of the science-based approach we're taking. We certainly, I, I want to make sure Council does understand, though, that um, disease spread is happening across the community um, because of primarily close social gatherings, and those are happening in public and private locations, certainly um, not exclusively in the environments that I know many of you are getting pictures of. So I do want to be clear with everybody that there is 
there is definite concern about spread um, anytime people are closer than six feet, and that does include many, many private settings. Um, we also have talked to legal about the specific issue that you shared. Other communities have looked at things like hours of operation, but that certainly is not something that is currently part of our order, and our, there are questions about what is possible with that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Giese or Mr. Peters? I do not see any other questions. I appreciate uh, all of your work and, and energy and effort on, on this, on this uh, continual um, concern. But uh, I, I think the message is, is loud and clear, and I appreciate the message from our city manager and from our health director, Gizi, that, that really now it's, it's up to us as a community to, to start holding each other accountable and others accountable for, for all, you know, all the things that we continually talk about as far as physical distancing and wearing masks and avoiding large social gatherings. And um, we, we, we have the ability to slow this down and it's up to us now. And I appreciate all of their work and council's work and, and, and our city staff and our county staff's work on continuing to get this message out there and continuing to, to, to make sure that we're as healthy and, and safe as we possibly can be. So thank you. Um, next on our agenda is the uh, consent agenda. And uh, do council members have any questions regarding the consent agenda or wish to remove an item for separate consideration? Not seeing any, then on a motion by council member Anderson and seconded by council member Klinkhammer, the consent agenda has been moved and discussion is in order. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council member Anderson? Aye. Beaton? Aye. Berge? Aye. Christofferson? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Gregert? Aye. Klinkhammer? Linkhammer? Aye. Lohr? Aye. Weld? Aye. Worthman? Aye. And the consent agenda passes. Uh, there are no proclamations today, and so we will get started on our business agenda. Uh, beginning with agenda item number nine, which is a resolution consolidating the micro loan, commercial building facade loan, and city revolving loan funds into a single city loan pool. Because this item amends the budget, a two thirds vote or eight affirmative votes is needed for passage. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. White. Good afternoon, can you hear me okay? We can. Thank you. And uh, the resolution before you uh, seeks to consolidate the three macro loan or the three loan programs that are currently operated by the city. Um, they were established under the current structure in 2018, and each was started with an initial amount of funding. The city revolving loan fund at 400,000, the commercial facade improvement loan fund at 315,000, and the micro loan fund at $100,000. Um, as loans are made out and repaid, the, the repayments go directly to the program in which they were lent out of. Uh, each program serves a different function. The city revolving loan fund um, services larger loans um, and also has a requirement that a business um, be in business for at least two years to be eligible to apply. The facade loan program is strictly for exterior improvements to commercial buildings anywhere in the community. And the micro loan fund is um, the only program that's truly open for startup and entrepreneurial type startup businesses. Uh, in the past two and a half years, or since I've come on board um, in late 2018, um, we have quite a bit of lending data under our belt now and we can recognize patterns. Since I've come on board, we've made no loans from the uh, facade program, although we do have two that will be coming up shortly. We've made one loan from the uh, city revolving loan fund, and we've made several loans from the micro loan fund. 
um, to the point where in late 2019 we had lent nearly all of the funds available in the microloan fund out. Um, it has since um, seen repayments being made, but they are, again, it's, it's a slow process. And we currently have one project that is ready to go before the loan committee um, that is only eligible for the microloan program, and there's not enough funds available in the microloan program um, to be able to uh, satisfy or be able to service this loan if it was made. So our proposal would be to consolidate all the funds available into a single loan program or a single um, loan fund, and then we can allocate funding out to the individual programs based on anticipated need. Um, our estimate for this year is we would expect to shift an additional $50,000 into the microloan fund, which allow us to continue making loans to that program. Uh, and then each year as the budget time comes up, we would look at where our potential need is for the following year and we could uh, make allocations accordingly. Um, the idea behind this would be to make the, the program a little more flexible so we can ensure that we have funds within each individual program that's seen the most need, which currently it is the microloan program, uh, and make sure that we can address the needs of the business community as far as a lending instrument to help move projects forward. Um, so that is the, the basis that we're looking to do on this program. Uh, is there any questions? Any questions from Council for Mr. Way? Council Vice President Emmanuel. Thank you so much, and thank you, Mr. Waite, for the presentation. It's, um, I feel a little bit of a presentation on hope that businesses are going to keep going. The city will continue to be a partner with businesses as they grow or have um, anticipated needs that the city can help out with. I do like the idea of having a consolidation. I think it does make a lot of sense. And I'm wondering about, I guess, two questions. Um, one on what um, the city might be considering or could possibly do around um, the strategic outreach to minority-owned businesses. So that would be one. And the second is um, just really around eligible expenses for the loan funds. If there is, um, I guess, out, if like outreach materials or outreach efforts to um, minority-owned business owners could be eligible for um, usage for these funds. So make sure that more people know that these funds are available and to really kind of demystify that process. Um, so I'd love to hear some feedback on that. Thank you. Mr. White. Thank you, Council Member Daniel. Uh, we are um, seeing a, a lot of interest in the loan programs and actually the banks have become probably one of our best recommenders. Um, a couple of banks in particular have directed several projects our way. Um, we typically will act as either the gap finance and a bank loan um, where there's a gap between what the applicant can put in for cash and what the bank is able to lend on the project. We've also had a few where the bank felt it was a very good program uh, or a very good project, but for whatever reason, the bank was not able to lend against. Um, we are exploring how we can broaden the message out. Um, we have put together some, uh, one of our interns had put together a, um, basically a fold-out brochure, uh, also digitally available. We're starting to disseminate that out um, to different organizations and institutes, particularly the banks, but also looking at um, any other type of community organizations that come in contact with um, potential businesses, potential borrowers from our program. We're, we're very interested in trying to reach our message further. Uh, we put that together and started to disseminate it right at uh, or just shortly before the Safe for Home order came about in March. So obviously we haven't seen a, a lot of you know, ability to push those out as much as we had hoped. But we are still seeing a number of interested projects. I've actually talked to several potential um, loan applicants over the last month or so. Um, and it's typical and when the economy gets a little um, tight that you see projects come forward and show some interest. Folks who are working for the company who think that maybe being self-employed might provide some more stability in terms of employment. Um, so we are continuing to see those types of interest. But we would definitely welcome any other ideas or thoughts on uh, how to get, how to better get in front of uh, minorities and more minority groups. Um, we have a strong interest in that and, and would love to see that push further out.
Council Vice President. Thank you Mary. so much. Okay. Oh, may I have a quick follow up? Certainly. Thank you so much. And thank, thanks, uh, Mr. White. That makes a lot of sense and good to have our local lending uh, institutions as partners. Do you know if the city has any baseline data around either the participants who, um, the lending institutions of who they might be serving as far as kind of that gap financing with the city and the percentage of uh, minority owned businesses and or does the city have any criteria of just direct engagement with minority owned businesses and their utilization of the loan pool? Uh, that's a very good question. It's not a metric that's typically tracked, um, but it's probably one that we could look back through some of our, our data. Um, I can say that the last two micro loans that we did, both of them were to uh, women-owned businesses, and um, I, I take that back to the uh, the city uh, loan fund, the one that we did in 2019. Um, it was you no. Know, Pardon, that was incorrect. That one was to a local loan business. The, one of the EDA loans that we did, which are separate from city funds, that one was to also to a women-owned business. Um, so we are seeing some um, some interest from those from that end of things. But it, it, it's something we could probably do better at tracking. It's not a typical metric that we ask or require or identify within the, the loan documents, but um, it's something we could probably go back to the records and take a look at. It's also not something that typically to the bank tracking. They may they may track that internally, but it's not something they typically share with us. Um, but we could get better about asking that question. Uh, Councilmember Berge. Thank you, Council President, and thank you, Mr. White. I was wondering. I know the city has a revolving loan fund committee. And if that would change at all, or their duties would change at all with the consolidation of these three loans? No, we would anticipate that that to function the same as, as always. Um, it would the, the consolidation of that loan and disseminating funds would be more of a staff function. Uh, we take a look at where the loans are being acquired, you know, which projects are coming into us, and which bucket of funding they are they are most appropriate to be directed to. And then we would simply ensure that from the main pool there is sufficient funds in any given program to meet the business needs. Uh, we would still need to carefully balance that. Obviously, there are um, some city loan funds that are coming up. We have a couple projects that may come out of the city loan fund, um, and we do have a couple projects coming up that would potentially uh, apply from the facade loan program. Uh, but we could help um, direct those funds as we see applications coming through. As far as approval, that process remains the same. Uh, the folks will have to submit documentation that's required. They'll go before the revolving loan fund committee and they'll make their they'll make their recommendations or rejections on the loans as they do today. Thank you. Any other questions from council for Mr. White? I do not see any. Thank you very much. Thank you. On a motion then by Councilmember Beaton and seconded by Councilmember Lohr, this item is moved. Is there any discussion? Council Vice President. Council Vice President. Thank you. Sorry, I had a delay on my end. No problem. Thank you so much. And I'll be certainly supporting this this evening I do want to share feedback and appreciation for the re receptivity of the idea of really trying to focus a little bit more on our engagement with minority owned business leaders and potential applicants. When we think about um, anti-racist work in our city, I think that's really a key part because if we can help lift people up as a partner who are experiencing significant um, financial challenges and or have some financial opportunities to grow their long-term wealth, that's a great thing. And so while a lot of conversation does sometimes get focused on law enforcement, I think that our responsibility, at least from my perspective, is that we really take a comprehensive look at how we're conducting ourselves with anti-racist work, whether it has to do with 
equity and um, finance tools to policing to really holistic approach on diversity and inclusion in our city. So um, while I don't have any amendment for this, I do want to pass on that feedback and that encouragement that I think we really should be looking at this and offer myself as a thinking partner with Mr. White on perhaps what could be some mechanisms to do some in reach with our community to make sure we have um, more people who are accessing these funds and then holding ourselves accountable to creating a baseline and then seeing how are we growing? What are we doing well in? Where can we do a little bit better at? Thank you. Thank you, Council Vice President. Any other discussion in regards to the agenda item? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Beaton? He, uh, aye. <laughs> Bergie? Aye. Chris Aye. Christopherson? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Gregor? Aye. Clay Cameron? Aye. Lord? Aye. Worthman? Aye. Anderson? Aye. And that agenda item passes. Agenda item number 10 is a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement with ZEF Energy Incorporated for a solar powered electric vehicle fast charging station at the Forest Street parking lot. Good afternoon, Mr. Noel. Hi, hopefully everybody can hear me. We can, yes. Good afternoon. Great. All right, I have a presentation for you this afternoon. Um, we're going to be focusing at the Forest Street parking lot uh, downtown. Next slide. You may remember back in February, you passed the Renewable Energy Action Plan, which included the EV roadmap. The EV roadmap, I call out here, kind of the main tenets of what that plan included, which was modeling the way, which we'd like to see in our municipal fleet an uptick of 15% of more EVs in the fleet by 2030, building a strong foundation which would mean adding more public charging stations, whether publicly or privately owned, and then sowing the seeds for transition with encouraging the marketplace development by 2030, seeing 8,000 registered EVs on our streets. By and large, cities that invest in charging stations do see an uptick in the amount of registered EVs on the road. Next slide. Just to recap market goals by 2030, we'd like to see in our fleet 15%, the community 10%, and Excel Energy, which I'll just note in the next slide, is looking for a more ambitious goal of 20% of vehicles on the road by 2030. Next slide. This is just a recap of their vision that was recently announced, looking to add 1.5 million EVs on the road as more models are released to save consumers fuel savings, uh, claiming $700 uh, less per year than gas, and also seeing a substantial uh, decrease in carbon emissions over that time period. Next slide. One of the key um, uh, understandings of the marketplace is what are the barriers to the industry. And the Public Service Commission, I just wanted to highlight, uh, recently had an investigation on EVs for policy and regulation considerations. They noted that charging infrastructure was the top concern in terms of reducing range anxiety so people don't run out of electricity while they're traveling. EVs are a little bit more money. Those costs are coming down as more models are um, on the road and more competition occurs. And then awareness and education about EVs and charging, and then also just vehicle availability, especially in small markets like Eau Claire. So next slide. So just looking at the outlook, this is a slide from Renew Wisconsin, which is um, a policy think tank on uh, renewable energy and electric vehicles centered out of Madison. They have done research which shows that more and more 
manufacturers are coming out with different models in the next few years. And as this competition uh, continues, this should drive down prices of those vehicles. Next slide. We're also seeing the technology increase in terms of light duty and um, medium duty trucks. Next slide. And also box trucks. And so there's more applications in terms of these vehicles. Next slide. Now I want to center on our, the grant opportunity before you. Uh, we received uh, word about this grant not too long ago, and we needed to act fast in terms to, in, in order to uh, work with the developer to secure the grant. And this map here shows you the I-94 corridor as it relates to Wisconsin and Minnesota. And this is a part of a larger clean, or clean fuel initiative from Montana to Michigan along the I-94 route. Uh, it's an initiative with the Department of Energy, that's where the grant funds come from, provided to the Gas Technology Institute, or GTI, which holds the funds, working with partners like Wisconsin Clean Cities and ZEP Energy. ZEP Energy, in this case, is exclusive vendor, turnkey developer for fast charging stations within Minnesota, Wisconsin. Um, along this route, we have, in the counties, over 16 million people, so it is a heavily traveled corridor and is seen by the feds as an opportunity to deploy fast charging. Because Eau Claire is centered on a fast charging station, we've already invested in level two charging stations at the North Barstow Galloway Rail. We were able to, uh, working with Zeph, have a double allocation grant, which is $54,000. Next slide. This recaps our project partners. The city is a co-developer with ZEF, where the site host at the Forest Street parking lot, where the asset operated, meaning that we can charge fees for customers to use it. ZEF Energy is a turnkey developer, bringing their experience of installing these stations in Toma, Hudson, and many Minnesota, Wisconsin, Minnesota communities. They're the general contractor and the owner of the unit for five years. Solar Forma is the exclusive custom solar parking canopy designer, a local firm that is based here in Eau Claire that we are working with to provide uh, a shelter structure above the charging station, but also to use uh, renewable energy to power the station. Cell Energy will provide most of the electricity beyond the solar canopy, and that will be, there'll also be an opportunity for co-branding as I had mentioned before with their initiatives for e more EVs on the road. Next slide. This information is contained in your memo in the packet, but in terms of city costs after total costs, the project could range from 120,000, 125,000 to 165,000. Um, there are some, uh, the reason why there's a, a range there is there's some contingent contingencies. The parking lot does have in spots some uh, remediation that may be needed after we do soil samples and we'll test those. We have already received the permission to proceed by the DNR. Um, and also some cost from Excel Energy, depending on exactly where we site the transformer and the electrical infrastructure to upgrade to be able to accommodate the 180 TW charging unit. In terms of operational costs, we project based off of uh, preliminary fees to charge users around $15,000 per year, which is in a conservative case of 126 hours per year of looking at different utilization scenarios of EV users plugging in, and with a payback with the solar canopy of 10 years, and that matches the useful life of the charging unit. Environmental benef benefits, we potentially could see 40,000 kilowatt hours of renewable energy used in the community for those that charge at the station, and greenhouse gases of 28.3 metric tons. Next slide. This is a, a photo, not the exact unit that we'd have in Eau Claire, but very similar. 
the ABB unit, which two, with two ports. Each port could accommodate up to 90 kilowatts. And if there was only one charger, 180 kilowatts, which could basically power an EV about 105 miles per 10 minutes. Next slide. Here is a, a rendering of the solar canopy. Um, what you'll notice here is a very um, attractive, elegant design that is mimicking ocean waves or river waves. And again, this is custom for Eau Claire. It would cover the two stalls um, for the one unit charger with the dual port access. There's a flexible solar film or uh, solar panel by Merlin Solar that uh, Solar Forma is using to be able to uh, lay these strips on the canopy and they'll be black. Next slide. And then to supplement uh, the generation that's provided by the solar canopy, uh, Excel Energy already provides about 26% renewable energy or electricity on the grid. And the balance would be covered by going on Excel's renewable connect rate. Next slide. This is a site map that shows the intended uh, electrical lines and mainly from the substation at the lower left corner, you'll see power would go in the red line to the top of the center of the picture to the transformer and then back down to the parking stalls where the EV charger will be located. This is a preliminary design. We will continue to work with Excel Energy and Zef um, and the solar and solar uh, form of design to refine this design. Uh, you'll note that in the yellow line, there's a property line. The city owns both parcels. However, we have restrictions on either side. We want to stay out of FEMA deed restriction land. There's open space requirements and floodplain requirements that are very restrictive. And so we've chosen the site um, the main electrical infrastructure, including the, the level three phase charger which looks like it's on the other side of the line right now, all on the DNR restricted side of, of this parking lot. So I just wanted to call that out. Next slide. And there is uh, a clause in the resolution before you that notes that there's an impact to the edible garden at Forest Street parking lot. And this circle is roughly the area about 500 square feet that may be impacted or that will be impacted. And the clause says that any plantings loss will be replanted in locations that are suitable. Next slide. A couple photos. The photo on the right shows the area in terms of where the transformer and the main electrical infrastructure will be placed. And those, I think it's an apple tree and a pear tree will be removed. And then at the substation, you can see how the power is going to connect from the three phase power. Next slide. My last thought slide here is uh, Zeph Energy, Jim Goodman, the VP of Customer Relations is available also uh, if you have any questions of him. And the res resolution is to enter into the agreement with Zeph to co develop the project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Noel. Are there any questions from Council for either Mr. Noel or for Mr. Goodman? Any questions from Council? I do not see any questions. Thank you. On a motion then, by Councilmember Christofferson and seconded by Council Vice President Emmanuel, this item is moved. Is there any discussion? Uh, Council Member Christofferson. Thank you, uh, Council President Weld. I, I have to thank Mr. Noel for this presentation. It was well covered in the newspaper, and I think it just shows the excitement from the community and uh, how right the Council was in their foresight to really move in a sustainable energy way. It's a wonderful project. These partnerships are, are so... Um, 
dynamic. And I, I'm just very pleased to be able to support this this, this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Christofferson. Councilmember Worthman. Thank you, Council President Weld. Uh, thank you, Mr. Noel, for your presentation and uh, the partnership as well. I just wanted to, um, you know, I think this is a good project and it's, you know, this, without a doubt, you know, we've talked about how are we gonna make sure that we're moving our community toward uh, zero emissions and 100% um, clean energy. And these are the kind of projects that elevate visibility and provide access for more EVs, which we've projected, I think, is going to be a 10% of all cars on the road over the next 10 years. Um, so, you know, we I think we're going to be seeing a lot more usage of these kinds of charging stations. There is uh, obviously an impact to the edible landscape uh, on Forest Street, I believe it was in 2014 um, when that parking lot was created. One of the uh, things that myself and other council members at the time voted for was to make sure that all of the landscaping that was put in in that area uh, was actually um, fruits and nuts and berries um, with the idea being that people, uh, especially folks in some of our uh, you know, underserved communities would have access to. And um, that passed at the time and uh, has actually gained, a, especially during COVID, has gained a lot more interest um, and commitment from neighbors and gardeners. And even I believe JAMP is a part of um, a new volunteer group to make sure that we're, um, you know, upkeeping those areas. And, uh, you know, unfortunately this is gonna impact, um, when I looked it was, two apple trees and a pear tree and uh, a few other berry bushes, which is, um, you know, is a real impact. But the hope is here, I think, that, that, you know, those will be made right. There are gaps in some of the other areas of this edible landscape where trees have died since the planting of this, um, which is a natural thing that happens, you know, with most orchards and with most trees. Um, but so hopefully there's a effort to make the, uh, the edible landscape whole again. And I think, you know, it, it, this is an important spot where we're seeing people, especially connecting with food, the farmer's market, the community gardens, um, and trying to think about how we um, also reduce our carbon footprint by, uh, you know, growing more, more of our own food in this community. So, um, you know, I think this is a good project and just wanted to give a little more context um, to where it's gonna be placed. Thank you, Councilmember Worthman. Councilmember Gregor. Thank you, President Weld, and, and uh, thank you, Mr. Noel, for your presentation and all of your work on this. Um, yeah, I certainly plan on supporting it. I actually heard from a visitor from Dunn County who wanted to, to come to Eau Claire last summer for a meeting with their Chevy Bolt uh, electric vehicle and they were asking me specifically where the charging stations were downtown so they could go to a meeting at Lazy Monk. And uh, I see this location being very con convenient for them if they were to ask me again, and I'll probably be passing it along to them for their future visits. Um, so, so there are definitely people that are, you know, in search of of this option uh, in our city and in our downtown in particular. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention, um, I think it's, it's great to see like the collaboration with local designers and entrepreneurs. Um, Solar Forma is a brand new you know, startup company here. Um, so it's really cool to, to see that they're involved um, because they've been looking for opportunities and. I'm glad that they're finding the, the city to be a, a good partner here. So just wanted to, to thank Mr. Noel and, and the rest of the city staff for their work and for the community partners involved in this. Thank you, Councilman McGregor. Any other discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Berge. Aye. Christofferson? Aye. Emmanuel? 
Aye. Gregert? Aye. Klinkhammer? Aye. Lohr? Aye. Weld? Aye. Worthman? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Beaton? Aye. And that item passes. And again, uh, our thanks to Mr. Noel and, and, and city staff and, and Mr. Goodman. Um, uh, takes care of our business agenda. We'll move on to ordinances for introduction. Uh, first one is an ordinance rezoning property located on the east side of Justin Lane, south of Arthur Street, from R1 to R3P, and to adopt the general development plan. Uh, agenda item number 12 is an ordinance rezoning property located at 3172 Old Town Hall Road from C3P to R3P and to adopt the general development plan for a community-based residential facility with 62-unit assisted living facility and to grant special zoning permission for the CBRF to be over 16 residents. And agenda item number 13 is a charter ordinance amending chapter 2.08 entitled City Council by specifically amending section 2.08.065 entitled Meetings, Attendance from Remote Location of the Code of Ordinance of the City of Eau Claire. Adoption of a, char a charter ordinance requires a two-thirds vote of the elected members of the governing body. Therefore, eight affirmative votes are required of the 11 elected council members for adoption. Does council wish to suspend the rules and take up any of these three ordinances this evening? Seeing no such desire, uh, that takes us to announcements. City Manager Peters. Thank you, Council President. Well, just uh, two quick announcements. Uh, one, if you have not signed up on Friday, the 18th of September is the Chamber's Eggs and Issues uh, with a Fall Election Outlook. And then the League of Municipalities Conference this year is going to be virtual, like most conferences are these days. That is, that is on October 6th, and uh, so if you'd like to uh, participate in the League of Municipalities Conference or the Eggs and Issues, feel free to reach out to Kathy, and we'll make sure we get you registered. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager Peters. Councilmember Christofferson. Thank you, President Weld. I, I just want to let um, my council colleagues know that the neighborhood summit that was so popular and successful last fall is going to be planned again for November. Um, I've invited some partners, um, and there is a UWEC intern who's going to be supporting that effort. So it'll be virtual, um, and the date is yet to be decided. Thank you. Any other, any other announcements from Council? Seeing none, and if there is no objection from Council, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. This program was brought to you.